Since we're continuing our little walk through the gifts of the Spirit, let's, and today we're going to be uh, dealing with, oh, that's horrible. I have just drawn a total blank. What are we, kindness. We're looking at kindness. All right, let's sing together. Since it's related to the Holy Spirit, this is very appropriate. Let's sing together hymn 447, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. We come to the part of service when we have the opportunity to lift our prayers to God. Now, uh, you've got an insert in your bulletin with all kinds of needs and concerns. I want to highlight one of them uh, that you may not have heard. Uh, John uh, Morris passed away this past week, Judy Morris's uh, husband. And his service was on Friday evening. We want to pray for Judy and, and her whole family, if you would. Uh, Dan, how is, how is Twinkle? She is about two and a half weeks where she was last year. She's going perfect. She is going really well? Oh, yeah, she's ready to go off the walker go to the cane. Man, that's good. Now, Twinkle had her second, though. Seven months. Hip replacement and seven months. And this one's even going better than the first one? At least two and a half weeks Whoa. You know, praise the ass. That deserves a round of applause. Outstanding. That's, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Yes, Doug Ogle, who was a former cup master here, is in Kuwait, Detroit, in Kuwait with the Air Force. Prayers, please. So we want to keep lift Doug up in our, in our prayers. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, Jim's dad, Bob Williams, is in Valley Hospice. Bob Williams, okay, in Valley Hospice. Okay, we want to lift him up in our prayers. Want to continue to pray for our brother Richie. Want to continue to pray for our brother Carl Hammer, who has been in the in the hospital over at Weirton. Yes, Pat. Now that Jonathan is in Africa 
and he has been on a, a three-week humanitarian effort. Um, they're doing surgery on the Savior and deformed children. He said it has been very wow. gratifying to him. Um, so and Kara has not been busy in Afghanistan, which is good, which means nobody's being hurt over there. Uh, continue prayers for um, Michael's family, and I have a couple of pictures. I don't know if you can hold them up and share. Oh, absolutely. A little Jameson who continues to need a heart. But we were just out there at the end of June, and um, he's really doing well for needing a heart. Well, he, he is. It looks like he's grown a beard. Yes. <laughs> so... Oh, oh no, that's Roger. I'm sorry. I got, I got him confused. You know, when you look at, when you look at him, it's, it's amazing because he looks incredibly healthy, you know, as a, as a little guy. You know, he doesn't look like he's sickly at all. So, um, but that's, he's still on the waiting list. He's still waiting for Michael is upset because he said that now he has to wait for someone's tragedy so uh, his, his son can live. But someone said to us, or said to Michael also, that there's just a heart out there for Jameson somewhere. We just don't know where. Absolutely. And, and uh, I heard a, a story, I think it was on television, I think it was on television, where a family that was the donor, a member of the family was a donor of the heart, and it really meant a lot to them that the part of their family was still living, you know, and that became really important, and they actually became involved in the life of the one who received it. So it, it can be a, a real blessing. I can see from Michael's perspective, but this is, this is God working. You know, God, this is God working. So, anything else we want to remember? Yes, Katie. I'm sorry. Senator Mr. McCain. Oh, yes, yes, Senator McCain. Yeah, that's, that's um, a very sad sit situation. Yeah. Okay, well, with this in mind, and also, of course, people on the road and, and those things. Let's go to God in prayer, and I'll open and pray for a little bit. Then you all will have the opportunity to lift your prayers to God, and we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. So let's go before God now in prayer. Lord God, you are present here with us right now. We are so incredibly grateful. Thank you so much for giving us that presence. You called us together to be in, in this place at this time. You, you've even given us a cool place to, to be in. And we are certainly grateful for that. Now, as we prepare ourselves to, to hear your word read and proclaimed, uh, we need to, to confess that sometimes we are not nearly as, well, we're not as kind as, as we could be. Uh, we don't live in a kind society. We don't live in a kind world. You know, kindness doesn't seem to be something that's valued. Uh, but that's no excuse. You still called us to be benevolent and gentle and loving and, and, and kind to those around us. And, and sometimes we, for whatever reason, we fail to do that. And so we ask that you forgive us for our lack of, of kindness. We also ask that you work that spirit within us. Uh, kindness is a gift of your spirit, so enable that gift, that fruit, to take root and to blossom and to grow so that we can communicate your love and your grace and your compassion to others through our interactions with them. Help them see you in the way we relate to them. Uh, help us to do that in the name of Jesus Christ. And now in the privacy of our hearts, we're going to lift up to you the concerns that we heard shared. We're going to lay before you all those things in that insert. And we're going to lift before you those concerns that weigh heavy on our hearts. Lord God, hear us now as we pray.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us. And of course, thank you for loving us as much as you do. But right now, we thank you for both forgiving us and responding to our need. And we know that you've forgiven us because that's exactly what you promised. And we believe that you will respond because we make these requests and we confess these sins in the name of Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray, praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would y'all come on out front to collect our offering? God, again, we want to give you a great word of thanks. To, you've given us a chance to be together this morning, to hear your word read and proclaimed, to feel it shared in this company. Guide and direct the leaders of this congregation that these gifts may be put to the most effective use possible. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You all may be seated. Let me, let me ask you, how many of y'all were here, here last week? How many of y'all came last week? That's, that's, that's good. Uh, wasn't, it, wasn't it a lot of fun with the music and, and, and the puppets? There's a part of me that feels tempted to go like this, this morning, you know? Uh, well, I'll tell you, we're going we're gonna to definitely do that again. But this morning... <laughs> 
<laughs> we're here to look a little disappointed now. Uh, anyway, we're not going to do puppets today. Uh, this morning we're going to go back to the series we started about a month and a half ago, uh, dealing with living in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, to this point, we have considered a number of different topics. It's, uh, in fact, five different topics. Uh, now, not all of them have been what Paul calls spiritual fruits, fruits of the Spirit. Because in the first message, we looked at the desires of the flesh. Now, if you missed that one, that was a good one. Uh, and how it's easy to uh, misinterpret and misuse the freedom we've been given in Jesus Christ. And then in the second service, we got into the, the different fruits. We started by talking about love and about how love is, at least Christian love, is both a decision and an obligation. Then during the third week, we considered how Christian joy is grounded in faith and how it strengthens those who are suffering and how it really needs to be shared among believers. And then in week four, we focused on Christian peace and how God has called us to live in harmony with ourselves and with Him and with one another. And then finally, in the fifth message, we talked about spiritual patience and how to be spiritually patient and may require humility and love and faith. Now, that's what we've covered to this point. So that's been just a, just a brief little summary. And this morning we're going to tackle the uh, gift number five. We're talking about kindness. As Paul wrote, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. And you know, this past week, as I was, was thinking about this business about kindness uh, and how I was going to introduce this idea, the first thing that came to mind was that wonderful line in an equally wonderful movie, A Streetcar Named Desire. Have you all, have you all seen Y'all seen Streetcar Named Desire? So it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful movie uh, based on a Tennessee Williams play, uh, also called Streetcar Named Desire. And and the line in the in the movie and in the play is one that that even if you haven't seen the movie, you may have heard the line because they've done parodies of it in different places. And the line is, I I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. Now, if you look at the cover of your bulletin and it's kind of dark, a little bit dark, that's actually a picture from the movie, a frame from the movie, where uh, 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 Vivian Lee is saying that line. Uh, now, if you haven't seen the movie, you may not know about the context. When, when this happens, uh, Vivian Lee, her character's name is Blanche Dubois. Uh, she is being about, it's near the end, she's being driven by the man to a mental institution. He's a, he's a doctor. Because she has had a complete emotional breakdown. Now, I'm not going to get into why that happened. Uh, but she did, and at that point in her life, she has kind of lost the last grasp she had on sanity. And she has completely drifted in to this fantasy world that she has built. Still, and so she, she says that line to the doctor. But if you look at the quote itself, I've always depended on the kindness of strangers, well that sort of encapsulates what we're talking about this morning. You know, how we're called to show kindness to others, including strangers. And I'll tell you something else, I think it points to a problem that most of us have. This business about showing kindness. You see, I don't think we lived, and I mentioned it a little while ago, I don't think we live in a society that puts much emphasis on stuff like kindness, or benevolence, or warmth. We don't live in a very kind society. I mean, give me a break. 
even among people that we want to hold up as role models, right? You know, people that we want to point to and say, you, to our kids, this is the kind of person you should be when you, when you grow up. I believe that we see a whole lot more hostility in them than peace. And more bitterness than forgiveness. And more malice than benevolence. I mean, let's get real. Is there anybody here this morning that believes we live in a good-natured, open-hearted, kind society. I mean, does anybody believe that that's our society? It's where kindness is emphasized? And I'm talking about our society. I'm not even dealing with our world. I sure don't. And so I think this call to kindness, and it's here, well, I believe it's really hard for us. Because not only does it cut against the cultural grain in which we live, I don't think we really know how to do it anymore. And even if we do, even if we know how to be kind, I don't think most Americans want to do it. Because often kindness is seen in our world, in our society, as a sign of weakness. Kind people are weak. They're the ones that get ground under by the strong, by the bold, by the assertive, by the aggressive. My gosh, I'm not sure that I've ever seen in my life. And I, you know, you know, I turned 60 a few weeks ago. I don't know that I've ever known in my lifetime a time when the phrase, good guys finish last, has been more true. I mean, it's a reality. And as soon as I start thinking, it's never been more true than it is right now, I wake up to a new day and before I eat my breakfast, I get my phone out and read the news and I see that I am wrong. It is more true, it'll be more true tomorrow than it is today. Ours is not a kind world. But you know, whether or not it fits into what we value or what we respect in others, whether we like it or not, Paul says the fifth fruit of the Holy Spirit is kindness. He says it. So whether we like it or not, whether we know how to do it, or whether we think it's important, kindness is exactly what we as Christians have been called to do. We can't get around it. It's right there. But here's some good news. Even though kind people aren't necessarily the ones we want to be in the front of the parade, we don't want kind people to be in the front of the parade. I think we have a perfect example about what this kindness business is all about. We can learn how to be more kind, and that lesson is right there in the Bible. And it's shown by the one who couldn't love us more than he does right now. The one who loved us before he laid the foundation of the world. You see, God is the one who defines kindness. Just like he was the one that defined love and defined joy and defined patience. And you know, when we follow the example of his kindness, we look to scripture to see how he was kind and how that might apply to us, I think I'm sure that we can be a whole lot kinder to one another as we go about our living. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. And like I said, we've got the definitive, defining example of that right here in the Bible. And I'll tell you, when we look at what it says, I think there are actually three lessons that we can take away from it and apply to ourselves. I mean, first, I think it's pretty clear that kindness was, it was and is and will always be a part of who God is. And I'll tell you, it's got to be a part of who we are as well. In other words, by his very nature, God is kind. And like I said, I think we see that in Scripture, especially in the stuff that the Apostle Paul wrote. For example, as he was explaining to the Roman Christians, 
And this was a really difficult question for him. He was explaining to them why God was uh, choosing them, allowing them to come into the faith and not other folks. He wrote this. Now you see both how kind and how hard God can be. He was hard to those who fell, but he was kind to you. And he will keep on being kind to you if you keep on trusting in his kindness. Otherwise, you will be cut off too. You see, God is kind. That's just who he is. And you know, Paul wrote the same kind of thing in his letter to Titus. He wrote, God our Savior showed us how good and kind he is. He saved us because of his mercy and not because of any good things that we have done. God washed us by the power of the Holy Spirit and gave us new birth and a new beginning. God sent Jesus Christ our Savior to give us his Spirit. Jesus treated us much better than we deserve. He made us acceptable to God and gave us the hope of eternal life. That's the kindness of God. You see, as both of these passages illustrate, God's kindness is shown by His willingness to treat us better than we deserve. And by His desire to save us through Jesus Christ. And by His decision to offer us the Holy Spirit that not only brings an awareness of who He is and what He's done, but also equips us to do what we've been called to do. You see, God can be our example because kindness was just part of His nature. We can look at what God did to define for us what it means to be kind. Of course, there's just one problem there. And it's an obvious problem with trying to use God as an example. I mean, the last time I looked in the mirror, I wasn't God. No, Enid, I wasn't. That's not who I saw. In fact, none of us are God. Now, that may be a shocking thing, and you may be uncomfortable with that, but I'm sorry. Man, we are not even close to divinity. And when you're talking about using God as an example of kindness, it gets even worse. I mean, just listen to what Paul said about our ability to be kind. And right here, he's quoting, and this is from Romans, but he's quoting Psalm 14. Paul wrote, There is no one who is righteous. Now that's good news, right? There is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. Not even one. You see, according to Paul... Regardless of who serves as our example, we can't really show God-like kindness even if we wanted to. We can't do it. In other words, it would be impossible for us to do it without some kind of help. We can no more show kindness than I can start flapping my arms and flying around this sanctuary. We can't do it. Not without help. But of course, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, right? You see, this ability to be kind, this ability to be godlike in our compassion and our sensitivity, Paul calls that a fruit of who? The Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, God does something for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. He gives us the ability to do a lot of things, one of which is being kind. In other words, he does the heavy lifting for us. And why would he do this? Why would he do that for for me? Well, I'll tell you why. Because God is kind. I mean, duh. And he offers this example we can follow. 
And we can do it with his help. And that's one lesson we can learn. And second, if we're serious about following the example we find in Scripture, then we're going to have to decide that we're going to be kind to everybody. Not just the people we like. Man, we cannot be godly. We cannot be godly and limit our kindness to a select few. Well, I'm going to be kind to, to them. But can't do it. We can't be godly and limit our kindness. Instead, that needs to flow out to everyone just like it did with God. Just listen to what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. He wrote, But God was merciful. We were dead because of our sins, but God loved us so much that He made us alive with Christ. And God's wonderful kindness is what saves you. God raised us from death to life with Christ Jesus and has given us a place beside Christ in heaven. God did this so that in the future world he could show how truly good and kind he is to us because of what Christ Jesus has done. You were saved by faith in God who treats us much better than we deserve. I heard that one place before. This is God's gift to you and not anything you have done on your own. It's, it isn't something you have earned so there is nothing you can brag about. Wow. God's kindness wasn't just given to some. You know, the select few, that, that group over there. And withheld from others. No, it's kindness covers all. And I think that's something we need to remember as we claim it and apply it in our own lives. You see, it's really not good enough really not good enough to be kind only to the people we like. You know, the people like us. That's not good enough. And it's not good enough to be helpful only to the people who are helpful for us. You know, the people who do what we want them to do. That's not good enough. And it's not good enough to treat with respect and dignity and honor only men and women we think deserve it. Because remember, God gave us something better than we ever deserved. Now according to Luke, Jesus said, If you have, are tired from carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. He didn't say that to one little group. He said it to all. Take the yoke I give you, put it on your shoulders and learn from me. I am gentle and humble and you will find rest. This yoke is easy to bear and this burden is light. Now you hear that and you may say, what the heck does this have to do with kindness? Well, I'll tell you. The Greek word that is translated here in this passage is easy to bear. Well, it's the verbal form of the word that Paul used when he wrote about kindness. In other words, you could say that his yoke is kind, is easy to bear. Following God's example. We need to decide, and I'll tell you something, that's really a decision on our part. We decide whether we're going to do it or not. We need to decide that we are going to be kind to everybody, even those we don't think deserve it. And that's the second thing the Bible can teach us about kindness. And third, when we're kind to others, I believe we're going to see them change. And I'll tell you, I think that's really exciting. Kindness changes people. And you know, we can see that same thing happen with the kindness shown by God. In other words, God was kind in order that people might change. I mean, I want you to listen to what Paul wrote to the Romans. Some of you accuse others of doing wrong. But there is no excuse for what you do. When you judge others, you condemn yourselves. Because you're guilty of doing the very same things. 
We know that God is right to judge everyone who behaves in this way. Do you really think God won't punish you when you behave exactly like the people you accuse? You surely don't think much of God's wonderful goodness. Or in Greek, God's wonderful kindness. That's the word that's used here. Or of his patience and willingness to put up with you. Don't you know the reason God is good or the reason God is kind? It's the same word here. The reason God is kind to you is because he wants you to turn to him. You see, there's a reason for God's kindness to us. There's a reason he's kind to us. And it's so that we will turn to him. And the word for turning is repent. In other words, God is kind to us so that we might turn from ourselves for crying out loud. From, from arrogance and from pride and from hubris and then turn towards Him. And that's turning towards love and mercy and compassion. Man, this is the goal. To see people change. And they do. And when we show kindness, when we show compassion, when we show mercy, when we show grace, I'm telling you, we're going to see people change too. I mean, not only will they change towards us, they're going to change in how they see the faith we share, the faith we live. And I'll tell you why that's so important, particularly now. According to research, and we all know research is always right. According to research, although almost as many people believe in God as they did in the past, fewer and fewer people are coming to churches to learn about it. Church involvement is going... As a matter of fact, a whole lot more folks are shuffling between churches than in coming from the outside in. And I'll tell you, I believe a big part of that is how a lot of folks have come to see the church. Have you ever listened to people outside the church talk about the church? Have you heard? I tell you, a lot of them say the church is just one big old social club. Just a big old club. Where people spend a whole lot more time sharing dirt about one another and judging those on the outside. You know how bad they are on the outside and how good we are on the inside except, you know, Gladys. And we all know what Gladys is doing, right? You know, that that's what the church has become. And I'll tell you something. We spend, they say we spend far more time doing that kind of thing than loving God and loving neighbor. We don't have time to love our neighbor, right? We're too busy trashing one another. Now you tell me who wants to go, go to a place like that. You want to go to a place like that? I don't. I don't. I've got to tell you, to a certain extent, I think they're right. You know, I think they got a good point. And I tell you, if you feel that way, they, yeah, the person's not going to walk through that door. But I'll tell you something else. I believe a little bit of intentional kindness on our part can change that. What do you think? And for that reason, I'm not sure we can focus all our attention on the inside anymore. I don't think we can do that. We may not be able to structure everything around making us feel comfortable. I'm telling you, that may not work anymore. Instead, maybe we have reached a point where our kindness, our compassion, our attention needs to include both. Now, I said both. Those on the inside and those on the outside. In other words, those on the outside need to see us in a positive light. 
In other words, maybe we need to spend some of our time and some of our attention showing folks who have may, maybe have gotten the wrong idea about our faith by the actions they have heard about or maybe even seen in the church. Maybe our intentional kindness to them. Maybe by doing that they'll begin to open themselves up to the one who loved them before time and will love them after time has lost their meaning. You know, maybe in the way you fill a bag of popcorn or smile as you take a dollar or maybe just smile as you go down the street. That little intentional bit of kindness, that may actually change a life. Now, I believe that can happen because the Bible shows us that kindness can bring change. And I think that's the third lesson. Now, in that movie, A Streetcar Named Desire, the motivation of the man who takes Blanche away may or may not have been kindness. I have no idea. There's no way of knowing. But for us, we can, be, we can decide to be kinder to one another. You see, we can claim that example that God leaves us and we can claim it because we've got the help of the Holy Spirit. And we can... Wow. <laughs> oh boy well I'm going to tie this up because it seems like somebody wants us to end a little early is that what you're saying yeah, we, I'll tell you we can be kinder to one another and it's going to change the way people see both us and the one we proclaim and you know this is something we can do and I'll tell you if this is our decision and if we do this kind of thing, not just as individual people, but as a Christian community, working together, man, we, we may touch people we have never met. And we might be, for them, for them, that stranger that shows them kindness. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, you've, you've given us this, this fruit. You've planted it in our lives. You've given, us an exa you've given us examples. You've given us an ability. You've given us reasons. We're called to be kind. Now, I know that doesn't fit into our culture, but who cares? You've called us to be kind. Help us to do that. Help us to be kind to one another but also help us to be kind to the stranger. Help us show kindness to the person we have never met. Help us to be kind to, to all people in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to be your instruments of real and genuine change. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Now, before we sing a last hymn, I'm going to offer you all this invitation. If there's anybody here who might be the grace of Jesus Christ and is interested in how he or she might respond, talk to me after the service. If you've got a question about the sermon or the service, talk to me about that as well. Now, you, the, uh, in your bulletin, you've got the closing song is what? What's the title of the closing song? Try a Little Kindness. Try a Little Kindness. Now, does anybody know who sang Try a Little Kindness? Because this was going to be a first for me. Y'all hadn't heard Try a Little Kindness? Glenn Campbell sang Try a Little Kindness. And it is really, really cool. And, and we would be singing this incredibly, incredibly fun, fun, fun song. But we can't do it, but don't blame Chris. Um, <laughs> so, Janice, what would you like to play? You don't have the music for that. How about 448? How about 448? What's the name of that? Uh, no one understands like Jesus. No one understands like Jesus. Let's go.
Brothers and sisters, go in peace. And be, be challenged in this next week. I'm going to challenge you to do a couple of things. One, I want you to stay as cool as you can possibly be uh, because it's going to be, uh, be another warm one. But I also want to challenge you to be, to be kind. My goodness gracious. Just be kind to the people around you. You know, and I include spouses and children. Uh, just, just be kind. Be gentle and compassionate. Have it apply to all those around you and look for the change that it will bring. And to empower this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.